let's get started on our learnings. First up, to talk to us about the investing landscape we're facing and what's happening in the world today, we have Mr. Edmund Lee. Edmund is the president and CEO of the Kaloom Trading Institute, the country's premier educational facility that aims to develop successful traders of global equity markets. He is also the chief financial officer for the global proprietary trading firm, CTS Global Equity Group, Inc. He is a CFA charter holder and a graduate of the Masters of Science in Global Finance program from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology Business School. Let us all please welcome to the stage, Mr. Edmund Lee. Alam natin, long weekend, eh, no? All right, uh, let's start, let's do this. Um, all right, good morning, everyone. Um, just to add to what Sir Dino was talking about, you know, we need to know it's a tough year. I like to call it tough years. Uh, you know, I've been in the market for over 13, 14 years, and I always tell people, you know, there's always something new to learn in the markets. Right? You think you've seen it all? Ha! Huh. Wait till you see 2020, and now you're seeing 2023. Okay. Um, one of the things that really helps me, and the reason why I'm still here, I mean, aside from the fact that we've been continuing to promote about long-term investing, um, one thing that I want all of you guys to understand is to accept everything is correct first. And what do I mean? Is that when you look at stocks today, there's always a common theme that you'll always encounter. Stocks are very cheap today in the Philippines, which is correct. You look at any broker reports, most of the time, most of the time they will tell you, hey, upside is still very big. Okay, so one thing I always try to do is always accept first thing, bakit mura? Right? So you look at companies today, perfect example, uh, Figaro, growing at 30-40%, margins 50%, mura, 8 times P, pag tinignan mo yung mga consumer companies, 25-20, first thing I always do is accept first, first, accept first why they are cheap. Okay, because there's many reasons as to why things are cheap. Okay, and now the reason why I ask you to do that exercise, okay, is to ask yourselves today, why is the market cheap? I mean, we've been trading at 13 times PE for the entire PSE. Why is the market cheap? Okay, and the first thing that, you know, when you do this exercise, and the one thing that will help you tremendously is to see things from a bigger picture. Because when you start to see things from a bigger picture, then everything will start to make sense. And that's the, really the purpose of my talk today, is to give you guys an insight on global markets. Okay? So one thing that I do know, and the perfect time, is to understand what the markets are already pricing in today, why markets are cheap. Okay? So coming off, I mean, before everything else, before coming off the crash that we've had last year, you have to understand what happened prior. Right? In 2020, we had a global pandemic, and basically what the Fed did is print over 20 trillion plus in total, and created one of the biggest bull markets that happened globally. In fact, the Fed balance sheet grew over 40% from 2020 up to 2021, and today we've seen one of the biggest bull markets happen in the U.S. Unfortunately, it didn't happen in the Philippines. Kasi pag print tayo ng pera, patay ng Pilipino. Okay? But in the US, they can print as much as they can, so they created this huge bubble. So going into the war, was it last year? So coming to the war last year, everybody started to blame, hey, supply chain, inflation, everything's so expensive because of the war. But people forget, prior to the war happening, we've already seen everything even in the Philippines, start to inflate. It didn't happen in the equity market, but where did it happen? Not in the stock market either. It happened in, example, crypto market, right? We've had 30 years in the PSE, one and a half million people started to invest. That's over a 30 year period. As of last year, we have seven and a half million accounts in Binance. Ano pa? Manila Gulf share. Pre-pandemic, 40 million. Last I heard, 160 million. Para lang pumalo ng golf. 
excuse me, ah, property prices today. Go to Rockwell, you go to Balmori Suites, not to knock on Rockwell because they always do an excellent job. Condo prices hitting today, 700,000 per square meter. Can you imagine? That's almost close to Singapore. Almost 1.2 million already in Singapore. And that's Singapore. Okay? Basketball carts. And what my point is, everything started to inflate. And so last year, coming from the inflation, we had everything start to deflate. And people forget that 2022, we've had the biggest route in terms of asset class. People forget, parang din na file, no? But last year, we've had the biggest route in asset class last year. To put that into perspective, in 2008, the largest global financial crisis, we lost $8 trillion in assets. I repeat, $8 trillion. Last year, na hindi na feel, we lost $35 trillion in total assets. Everybody thinks it's in stocks, which is correct. We lost $8 trillion in stocks. We lost a trillion in the crypto market. But in reality, we lost $25 million in the bond market. Okay? So what I'm saying is this, the reason why you need to show all these things today is because all these things are playing out already. Tapos na. We already know that. Things already started to deflate. Right? And so this inflation crisis that happened last year, what's happening today is just what we call a high base effect. Meaning, if you go out today, you'll notice that inflation headlines are going down. But parang mahal parang bilihin. Right? Because it's just high base effect. It doesn't mean the price went down. It just means it stopped going up. That's the difference. And that's the reason why we're starting to see headline inflation, which is my second point, start to go down. Okay? And now the third part, which I'll get into later, is to talk about rich valuations, not in the Philippines, but mostly in the U.S., despite earnings contracting. Okay? So if I show you this chart, I mean, you're looking at things in the gloomy economy starting to slow down. You'd probably think we're somewhere around, I don't know, here. And if you look at the U.S., maybe here. But the point is, we're probably in stage six or stage one. And, you know, it's irrelevant because what's happening today is now the timing is becoming more important. And to predict exact timing, your guess is as good as mine. Okay? So what's important, like what I said to you guys, is to prepare yourselves, look at both sides of the spectrum of what's to come, then it will become easier for you as investors to start participating in the market. Okay? So again, we talked about high inflation. And so what the Fed did to combat high inflation is to raise interest rates. Okay? In fact, we've had the fastest rise in interest rates because last year we came from zero today we're at 5.25 that's the fastest in history okay so think of it today before you had no alternative you had room to speculate that's why people go to other markets or other asset classes today very different because today instead of going to the equity market now people have an option hey Pwede na atang 6.5% sa Philippines eh. Right? You put your money in a time deposit or whatsoever, you get 6, 6.5% risk-free. Without, technically, risk-free. Without trying to think about what's going to happen. So these are the things that the world we are facing today. Right? So, good part is, parang hihinto na. Right? So the Fed basically made this announcement very different from early 2000s because bulaga lahat. Today, they're already preempting you. Meaning, what is the Fed's message? Okay, we've already caused so much damage in the system. Okay, we're gonna be pausing. Let me be clear. Pausing. Not reducing interest rates. We're just pausing. Okay? And so, what's the impact of pause or what's the impact of... You know, I'll skip this part because I already explained this about this inflation. But what's the, really the impact of a pause? Okay, a pause is usually a good signal to the market because it's already telling you, remember, markets don't react on recessions. They react forward-looking. So meaning the market's already pricing in a recession, what the market is saying, okay, alam na natin yan, now we're starting to pause. Okay? And now if you notice here, on average, right, after markets make that announcement of a pause, markets rally 12 months, 3 months later, around 
oops, 9% here, 9% there, okay? And usually the average tenure after the first rate cut is around six month window, okay? Eh, isn't that a good sign, right? Like post eh, alam na na slow down eh. So we're gonna start putting in more liquidity into the system and hopefully equity markets rally. And that's exactly what's happening to the markets today. That's why you'll notice why is the US market continue to head higher because anticipation of a Fed pause is actually what's happening today. In fact, this is the market today. This blue line here is the, uh, what's not happening? This blue line here is the, ayaw talaga. Okay, anyway, the line chart here, the blue line here, is basically your 10-year treasury. And you'll look at it, it's not moving, it's just moving sideways. Okay, if you look at your yellow chart here, that's interest rates. So what the market is saying, okay, interest rates are high, markets, the blue line, which is going sideways, is now pricing in, hey, para magpopos na. So this is what we already know, okay? And that's why if we fast forward and look at the markets today, nagarali na yung market. Okay? So to give you guys a perspective, something's wrong with my clicker. Okay, so to put you guys into perspective and see how this happened historically, this is 2006. Okay? So if you look at 2006, after the announcement of a pause. So this is the real interest rates. Pause. I'm sure, hopefully you guys see it. Like pause, the yellow line, like pause. Equity markets, which is the candlestick bars that you see rallied from July over the next year to July, one year later. Okay, 2018, pre-pandemic, same thing. You'll notice that that yellow line over there, that pause, you see that peak? Same thing. After that peak, markets rallied from 2019 all the way to, to December of 2019. Okay? If I zoom this in, it gives you a better perspective about that pause. See that pause? Same thing, markets rally. So what's the problem? 2006, after that pause, yes, markets did rally. We had the 2008 financial crisis. 2020, after that pause, markets did rally. We've had the greatest pandemic and asset classes fell over 30, 40% after, okay? Now, I'm not here to scare you, okay? I'm here to prepare you, okay? And just to give you guys an insight, because it's the same thing what's happening today. Markets now expecting a pause, Equity markets are now rallying. Okay? Now, this is what's happening outside, huh? unfortunately, in the Philippines. Tayo. Okay? But this is just a good gauge for you, so at least you know what's expect, what to expect in the short term. Okay? So, again, this is very much different because in the US versus the Philippines, we always talk about Philippines being cheap. In the US, it's actually expensive. Okay? So, in a period where interest rates are high, you'd expect a derating or a smaller or cheaper market. Today, it's not. Interest rates are high, markets expensive pa. Okay? And the worst part is earnings or revenues are now on the decline. In fact, markets are now pricing in a 13% decline in terms of earnings. Okay? Good part is markets know all this. Okay? So what's happening to the markets today? Okay, decline nga 2023. Okay lang, six more months, 2024 na tayo eh. Pag ka ng 2024, earnings growth na ulit. Okay? So these are things that the market knows already. Okay? That's the reason why markets are so efficient. Okay? But like what I mentioned a while ago, I need to prepare you for the worst case scenario. Okay? And this is the reason why when we talk about that pause, is because it didn't really eliminate the problem. The reason why we're pausing is because things are already slowing down, okay? We already caused so much damage, now things are now slowing down, right? And so to just give you guys evidence of slowing down, okay? Coming from this 
fastest rate hike here today in 2022 to today, just to put that into perspective, in 2006 to 2008, and even in 1994, you'll notice we've never had rates rise this sharp because of what happened. Okay, And so some other indicators of what happens when interest rates rise so much in a so short amount of time, loan slowdown, we've had a banking crisis coming from the liquidity from Signature Bank, SVB, First Republic, things exploding. The good part about today, though things that are exploding, in my personal opinion, is a liquidity problem, not a credit problem. And so what's the difference? It's not the, it's not the consumer that's defaulting today. Actually, the consumers are healthy. In fact, the banks are also very healthy, except that it's a liquidity problem because when their interest, interest rates went up, their assets went down, and so now what the Fed has to do is just plug in that gap. Right? So when they plugged in that gap and asked some of the big boys to take over the smaller banks, okay na. So when I look at it, there's really no credit problem so far. Okay? The problem is, right, is credit slowing down? Definitely. Would you borrow at higher interest rates today? Maybe not. Because last year, zero utang ko eh. Ngayon, utang ng 5.25%, wag na lang. Okay? So these are some of the dilemmas that the market now is facing. In fact, in terms of credit, you'll notice that the credit... Oh, sorry. Here on the credit, you'll notice that when credit starts to slow down, here on the right side, We've had a crash that's happened throughout the different cycles from the dot-com, 2008 financial crisis, Gulf War, and even the pandemic. Okay? This is just to prepare you guys. Okay? Now, I really think it's going to be different. I hope not. Oh, sorry, I really hope it's going to be different, and especially in the Philippine settings, and I'll probably end by showing you guys something more positive. Right? Today, it's a little bit different. Again, why? Because consumer is still strong. Okay? What's the word that we've learned over the last two years? Revenge spending. Right? Till today, revenge spending is still evident. In fact, Delta Airlines just came out with an article. Okay? There's still a 300 billion gap that large about how strong the consumer is and the supply for them. Meaning people are still going out, traveling, spending. It's just different priorities today. Right? In fact, despite what happened last year, household savings, although it went down, is still very much elevated. You'll notice here at the last chart here in the last bar chart. Right? So these are things that are happening today. We're slowing down, but again, the consumer is still very healthy. So a soft landing or an engineered soft landing of things slowing down actually could be healthy for the markets in general. Okay? So, passing on this to the Philippines and seeing how, why we're a little bit more positive in the Philippines despite what's happening outside because we don't expect a recession to happen in the Philippines. Okay? And that's the reason why, I mean, combined with very cheap valuations, right? If interest rates start to go down, I think it's going to be also posing well for the Philippines and the emerging market, right? Inflation also heading lower. Although we're lagging our peers, still, right? Just because on high base effects, we're still seeing inflation start to go down. So growth still intact, inflation starting to slow down, right? We might go through this no interest period in the markets, but again, I mean, if you're looking at it from this perspective, there's no way, I mean, in my opinion, Right? There's no way we're going to see a substantial drop in the markets. I mean, we might have a 10-15% drop coming from what's happening outside, but to see what happened, maybe a 40-60% drop because of a hard recession, I see that very unlikely happening in the Philippines today. Okay? So, other good indicators about the Philippines? Wala na rin investors sa Pilipinas. Okay? So, we laugh at it. But parang foreign ownership, I mean, you need the foreigners and everything, okay lang, wala naman sila to begin with. Okay? So the thing is, crisis or sell-offs or panics happen normally because of two reasons. One is because somebody made so much money. Example, crypto. 
crypto goes from $13,000 to $67,000 per coin. So when that sell-off happens, it happens fast. And that crash happens fast because so many people made money. Sa Pilipinas, wala pang kumikita. Okay lang yan. Okay? Second part is about valuations and about expensive. So normally when you have excess, things are expensive. That's the reason why we're a little bit worried about the U.S. But the Philippines, good part is, lagi tayong mura. Okay lang yan. Mumurain lang tayo. Hanggang kaluluwa natin. Okay? So you look at the markets today, just to give you a perspective also, Philippines, at 2008 financial crisis, the low was 11 times PE. Today, it's 13. Ngapit na tayo sa financial crisis. <laughs> We're almost there. So my point is, I don't expect a big crash to happen in terms of the equity market in the Philippines. Because again, those two reasons, wala pang kumikita, wala naman tao, tsaka hindi naman tayo mahal. Okay? So, going through all that, and knowing all that, how should we prepare ourselves I'll probably end with this. For me, again, it's still sticking to the defensives. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity because here you learn about the different mutual funds, different options that you might have, right? Good part is, if you have a 50-50 stock bond portfolio, in the event that we do have a recession and stocks go down, their bonds should actually outperform. Now, I'm not here to summarize what the next speakers are going to talk about, but indirectly, it's a good defensive mechanism for all of you here today, right? Stick to yield, stick to yield, stick to recession-proof businesses and sectors. I still like the consumer. At the end of the day, whether things slow down, people are still going to Jollibee, still eating your Pancit Canton, and still eating your Jack and Jill, right? So that's the reason why I still like the consumer sectors. And I still think that most of them again, are cheap today and are giving a decent yield than before. So for me, again, guys, if you're not sure about what's happening, lengthen your time horizon, see things from a bigger picture, and I'll tell you, panon panon lang to. If you've seen you've had difficult times, I've been here again for more than a decade. And the, dec and the last decade, stocks are flat in the Philippines. But why am I still here? Because again, it only takes one or two years worth of a good run to make everything worthwhile. People forget that coming from 2008, in 2010, we've had the greatest bull market also in the Philippines. Right? Markets went up 200% from 2010 all the way to 2013 and stayed flat after. The thing is, if you're not invested and you're not here, how are you going to see it when it does happen? And so the point of this entire exercise and this entire talk is to prepare all of you individually what can happen from both ends of the spectrum, how you can monetize it, and hopefully all of us here, more people start coming in and more of us start to make money. Right? All right. Okay, that's it. Thank you guys so much, and I wish you guys a fabulous morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edmund. May I invite you for a quick Q&A? A lot to unpack with your session, but um, there's a few things, a few points that I want to drive at before we let you go. Um, so today is about investing strategies for the smart investor, right? Uh, could you just bridge that connection or make that connection between what we are talking about, what you discussed, and why investors need to know about it? Have an overview of what's going on in order to be a smart investor? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And the reason why, it's because we're always advocate of buying when things are cheap, which is correct, right? Kasi muro ngayon eh. When do you start accumulating pag mahal? Walang kwente, right? It's just that, you know, because things are cheap today, you have to understand why things are cheap today. And that's the purpose of today's talk, is to prepare you individually, investors, right, to prepare for what's to come, right? Whether it goes through a hard landing outside or not, I mean, it's anybody's guess. But the good part is understanding this and understanding things from a bigger picture, at least hindi kayo matatakot if it does happen, right? And that's the reason why we try to optimize portfolios and give you guys insight as to how you want to be positioning yourselves. So at least when it does happen, you don't have an excuse to say, I did not know because all of these things are already present to you today. Thank you. I guess knowing then to counteract the fear and hesitations of investing. Um, I also wanted to ask, you mentioned about timing. You showed a, a few charts, right, of um, 
how things can repeat itself um, uh, over time. Um, timing versus time in market, what would you say is, um, would be the best strategy, strategy to apply for a smart investor? Of course, from an investing perspective, time in the markets is always more important. Right? But there's a way for you, I mean, having this time in the market to optimize your portfolios. And I guess that's the talk uh, of the remaining morning and afternoon to give you guys idea on how you can optimize your portfolios so that when the volatility is happening, you're able to stomach it. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, you also showed, um, painted a picture of what happened in 2006, 2018, and now it's 2023. How much of a window do we have? Um, I'm sure long term, definitely, um, there are opportunities there. You mentioned, you know, as you said, um, time in the market. But are there opportunities that investors can still take advantage of now? And what's that window looking like? <laughs> Unfortunately, um, our expectations for the U.S. is the U.S. market to go higher in the short term. Short term, huh? let me be clear. Huh? Like what I showed to you guys a while ago, markets normally rally after Fed pauses, which is what's happening today. Are we going to expect the same thing in the Philippines? <laughs> I cannot answer that because I'm leaning towards no. And the reason why, it's because there's just not enough liquidity and there's not enough participation in the markets. Okay? But now, with that being said, should you be discouraged from investing in the short term? My answer is also no. And the reason why, it's because you have to be investing in the short term and in the long term. And the reason why today is because most of the corporates, and I'm sure Charles will show later, are now giving you a yield to stay with you. Right? So meaning, if you look at DNL today, DNL gave 4.2% cash dividend. Great company, although business is slowing down. 4.2% cash dividend. Your power companies, such as Aboitis Power, giving you 4% cash dividend. Right? You're looking at some of the property companies, and we were talking about a while ago. I've never seen property companies give out cash dividend. Why? Because they're always fully invested, creating new projects and whatsoever for their cash flow, affecting their cash flow. Today, most of the property companies now are giving you decent yield for getting paid to wait. Right? Um, and I guess that's the main message. Is, and also the conclusion is to stick to the ones that are defensive, stick to the ones with yield, and stick to the ones that are recession-proof so that you can be able to wait this game out. Thanks, Edmund, for that slight segue also to the next topics that we have. Last one for me before I let you go. Um, we've, we've talked about a lot of global headwinds, things to watch for in the U.S. mainly. Is there anything that we need to watch for here in the Philippines, or is it mainly um, really all outside? I obviously have to say something positive about the Philippines, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You know, the, 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 one of the issues really with the Philippines, it's we're really in a different circumstance as opposed to our emerging market counterparts. And what do I mean? It's because most of our emerging, mounter, emerging market counterparts are export-driven countries, right? And they're mostly commodity-related. So if you look at Indonesia, you look at Vietnam, you look at Thailand, uh, most of these guys are uh, commodity-related countries and exports. That's why they were able to benefit um, despite what happened over the last year and a half, right? Philippines is in a different situation because our exports are human capital, right? Also, although still very strong, uh, both OFW and BPO still very strong. Um, hopefully with things happening today, um, we're going to be affected more positively, especially as commodities continue to drop, right? Um, when I look at it, I think commodities can drop some more, which I think will also bode well for the Philippine consumer. And hopefully that will serve as a catalyst and serve as good news for everybody here. And hopefully restaurant prices start to go down. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Edmund, for your time, your insights. I'll let you go now. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.